thanks so much for coming, guys. Um, what an awesome view, too, right? I love living in San Francisco. Um, so anyway, my experiences with the internet don't hold up when I start to think about people in other places around the world. Um, Silicon Valley and the United States are both bubbles of great internet. Um, but beyond just geography, our mere expectation of good broadband connectivity is a little bit crazy, considering it's such a recent thing. You know, it wasn't all that long ago that we had to worry about our families kicking us off the net when they picked up the phone. In some cases, literally picking up the phone and breaking the modem. Um, and folks around the world have their own versions of this. For example, in 2011, in Georgia, that's the country and not the state, um, a woman, a woman uh, scavenging for copper cut off neighboring Armenia's internet for five hours when she severed the backbone cable going to Armenia. And this actually happened. <laughs> right? <laughs> now, I'm not suggesting that we need to optimize and protect our websites against shovel-in-the-middle attacks. <laughs> but my point is rather that um, the internet's infrastructure is rapidly getting better and it's rapidly expanding. And so it's up to all of us in this room to make our experiences as performant and as great uh, for as many people as possible. Um, so Netflix is global. We want to connect people all over the world to our great content. And we've got folks working on, on video and coding and streaming, streaming algorithms and other aspects of the streaming experience to make those performant. Um, but to get people to enjoy our great content, first we've got to get them signed up. And that's where me and my team come in. We work on the sign-up flow. So hi, I'm Tony. And you can see me right there above Mars. And uh, I'm a UI engineer on the website. And I want to tell you about some of the things we've been doing to speed up the performance of our pages. So today I want to cover an introduction to the Web Performance API. I want to tell you how we sped up Netflix.com. And then I want to tell you about, um, oh, I need to go to this slide, sorry. <laughs> then I want to tell you about um, some prefetching techniques we use to speed up our single page apps. And then I want to help you um, determine the effectiveness of those prefetching techniques. So let's get started with, web, the, with the Web Performance API. So um, it's a very, very broad topic, and I'm only going to touch a little bit here. So I suggest you all spend the rest of your Friday night um, looking at the spec on MDN and read more about it. Um, so let's just dive right in. So just sitting out on the window uh, object is this performance property, and this is the performance API. And in general, you can use it to instrument the performance of your web pages. And it contains lots of useful properties. And I'm going to talk about two of them for you today. So within the performance um, property, we have this timing property. Now, please don't try to read all this JSON. Um, but anyway, the, the timing property contains information about the performance of the page itself. And I want to highlight two figures for you today. So we have request start, and we have DOM interactive. We can use these two timestamps to calculate a pretty useful metric for us. At Netflix, we call that time to interactive, or TTI. Now, what this actually represents, and this is the difference in time, between when the user clicks go on their browser and when the DOM report itself is interactive. In this case, it's 1,600 milliseconds for this uh, example. So here's a, a really simple bit of JavaScript that will calculate this for you. So you can see we're just grabbing the request start and DOM interactive off of the performance API, and then we're subtracting them. You can drop this into any website you want in the console, and it'll spit out a figure for you. So just like we can use performance API to instrument the page itself, we can also use the performance API to, uh, to see how, our, how the page's resources are performing. And a resource is anything like a JavaScript file, an image, CSS, stuff like that. So this function here will return an array of objects, which are resource entries. And those look something like this. Now again, please don't try to read this. Let me condense it to the important stuff. So we have three things here. We have name, which is the URL of the resource we're considering. And we have the duration. And this is in milliseconds. And this is how long it took the browser to load the resource. And then we have the transfer size. And this is in bytes. And this is how long it takes. Um, oh, sorry, this is the size of the resource as it goes over the wire. And this is important. And I'll come back to it in a little bit. OK, so now we've got, we've got all this stuff instrumented. But what do we do with all this data? Well, we have a huge team at Netflix, actually, who deals with uh, making a client-side logging library for us and all of the data pipeline that goes underneath of all that. And we have a bunch of data scientists who will compile these nice reports for, for the engineering team to instrument our performance. Now, that's really great for a big company like Netflix. But what if you're a smaller firm, or what if, you're, if it's just you? Well, 
Google Analytics actually has you covered there. So if you look at the, uh, the left pane of Google Analytics, you can see that there's a, a site speed. So I suggest you go check that out. And there's other third-party tools as well. So now that you know how to measure things, let's talk about what we did to speed the site up. So many of us in this room have come to know and love React, and we definitely do here at Netflix. But I'm suggesting that you trash it. <laughs> what? I know. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, let me be more clear. I suggest, <laughs> I suggest you, you remove it on the client if your client doesn't need it. Um, in this case, I'm talking about a landing page, so you can think of it as deferring React. We still use React, and I'll show you how. So you can let React render things on the server, and then handle interactions yourself on the client using vanilla JavaScript. So let me show you an example of something that we did. So this is what we call the non-member home page. This is what you land on if you hit netflix.com and you're not signed in. Um, it's the landing page, um, and it's, and it's the, the front door for Netflix. And so people come here, and they want to sign up or they want to sign in. And since it's the first page that a user often sees, we thought it would be a good first uh, target for performance optimization. So I'd like to take a brief aside about our stack. So Netflix.com runs on Node.js, and we render the UI in React. We use what's called universal JavaScript, which means we use, the, we use React to render the UI on the server. And then we ship the HTML document fully formed down to the client, and then the client will request um, React and other client-side JavaScript to respond to state and to React and to, to facilitate interactivity. So now back to the home page. We found that, that this page contained about 500 kilobytes of JavaScript. Some of it was React and other client-side code, but actually a lot of it was a bunch of JSON payload that was required to hydrate React's app state. Um, so using Chrome's DevTools, I can throttle the network, in this case, to a slow 3G mobile connection. And we can see how long the page takes to load. In this case, it's taking seven seconds, which is pretty ridiculously long when you consider that it's just a landing page. Um, and this is actually kind of an ideal case. You know, network throttling might not give you things like dropping packets and stuff. So maybe a more realistic case would be, I'm in India on a low-end device, and I'm going on a train through a tunnel or something. Um, but anyway, we can do a lot better than seven seconds for a landing page. So um, we asked ourselves, how much of this 500K do we actually need? We asked ourselves, do we need React on the client? Um, could we have used Preact? Preact or other lightweight frameworks, or even just like a templating engine? Well, yeah, sure we might have, but I want to highlight a few reasons why we decided not to. One, as I said, all of Netflix's stack is built in React, so there's that, and it would be kind of a pain in the butt to implement another rendering pipeline. So we've got that. Um, and then two, we get a lot of benefit and developer productivity from being able to reuse components. Like, for instance, we have a header, we have a footer, we have buttons, we have other stuff. So there's a lot of benefits of us using React, even if React is probably too powerful for a landing page. Um, and we figured we could go a little simpler. So to answer the question of, do I need React on my client, the simplest way is to just turn JavaScript off in the browser and see, and ask yourself, does the page still work? Well, in our case, yes, it, it largely works. Um, the sign in button is an anchor link. That works just fine without JavaScript. And the sign up button is just a form button, so no problem. We have other things, though, like we have some buttons which required some JavaScript, um, some click handling, some CSS cla class adding. Not too tough to do in vanilla JavaScript, though. We did have other stuff as well. We have a language switcher, and we have a client-side logging library, which we had to rebuild in plain JavaScript. But if I remember right, it was like under 300 lines of code, so not too bad. So how much did all this help us? Well, um, as you can see here, we reduced the payload by over 400K by not shipping React and the payload down to the client. You can see here that in, in uh, this, I don't know, gold color, we have the client-side JavaScript. And then in the red, we have the big JSON payload that I mentioned, which was embedded in the HTML document. And then the blue is just showing that the HTML document we didn't actually change. So again, we were shipping the, the page completely already rendered, so why not just implement the interactivity using plain JavaScript? So these are nice. This is a nice reduction in size, but how does it actually help? So by not shipping React to the client and rewriting some functionality in plain JavaScript, we saw a 50% reduction in our time to interactive metric, which is pretty substantial. But what was maybe more interesting to me is that by doing this, we found that users clicked on the sign-up button at a greater rate, 
which gave me great confidence that what we were doing actually mattered to our end users. So you may be asking yourself, well, well that was really great, but that's just a landing page, and they're pretty simple. But I have a really big React app that I spend a lot of time on. It has a lot of different views. It handles a lot of different changes in state. Like it's, it's, um, it's important. It's big. And I can't imagine rewriting it in plain JavaScript. And that's fine, and we do too, and we've got you covered. So while the user is admiring your beautiful and now lightning fast landing page, why not use that time to prefetch resources used in the next page? So that way, when the user clicks that, that uh, start your free month button, they have taken to this page, which Mars just talked about, but it's lightning fast. So um, let's see, sorry. I wanted to mention that we get a lot of questions about service workers and why we didn't use service workers for this. <laughs> um, for two reasons. One is it doesn't have Safari support yet, and it's pretty much a deal breaker for us. But then two, um, service workers are awesome, and I think they'll have you know, a great life um, for progressive web apps. But for our sign-up flow, if we're doing our jobs right, the user signs up and then never comes back and sees this ever again. So there's not really the, the reusability use case that service workers are often made to address. So it wasn't exactly right for us. Um, but I do want to show you two things we did actually do to prefetch. So one, we used a built-in browser API, and has a few trade-offs. And then we kind of came up with a, a neat technique that I want to show you, which overcomes some of those trade-offs, but has a few of its own. So let's talk about the built-in browser API. So the implementation here honestly couldn't be simpler. It's just a link tag within the head. And this href here, is just the URL of the resource that you want to prefetch. So in this case, it's an HTML document. It happens to be for that sign up app. But it doesn't have to be an HTML document. It could be any resource. It could be JavaScript, it could be CSS, an image, anything the browser can use. One really important thing to keep in mind with using this API is that it's just a hint. As you're reading the documentation later on tonight, on a Friday night, um, you'll see words like can and should and may. Definitely not strong language, in my opinion. Um, the browser is trying to make an uh, intelligent decision about whether or not to prefetch. It's considering things like device capabilities, network conditions, you know, how many tabs you have open. It's trying to make the best choice because you it doesn't want to waste the user's resources and bandwidth or something on a page that the user may not even end up seeing. However, since we have a pretty linear sign-up flow from the home page, um, we thought we could do a little better, and we thought we could, we could do better than just a hint. So, as it turns out, you can just make, make an XHR call for resource, and the browser will just cache it. You just make the request. You don't actually have to do anything with what comes back. So let me show you how this works. So this little bit of JavaScript, given some resource URL, will make a new XML HTTP request. It'll open a GET request for that URL, and then it'll make the request. But notice I don't have any callbacks. I'm not actually doing anything with what comes back and this will allow the browser to cache it. It's actually pretty crazy and miraculous that this works, but <laughs> it does really well. Um, one important thing to note about this technique is that you can't do it with an HTML document. So for the purposes of, of this project, we actually use both techniques. We use the built-in browser API to prefetch the HTML document, and then we use the XHR technique to prefetch the CSS and the JavaScript bundle. And so here's a comparison of the two techniques. So unfortunately, the built-in browser API suffers from partial browser support. Um, as you might expect, Chrome and Firefox doing great, guys. Um, Edge is actually doing really good, too. Um, but Safari is kind of falling flat here. Maybe they'll get to it. Um, and whereas the XHR has been uh, you know, a browser standard for years, and so superb browser support. The success rate varies depending on browser. We saw anywhere from 30 to 90%. I think 30 was more on the edge uh, browser side, but Chrome, I think, was like 80 to 90%, so pretty good. But we were delighted to learn, and this is why we really pushed on this technique, is that the XHR prefetching technique had over 95% success rate. So I, I chalk this up to it not being a hint. It's more of like, yes, you will prefetch this. The ease of implementation, it's kind of a wash, one or three lines of code, so it's about even. But where the browser API really stands out, is that it's the only one that can actually prefetch that HTML document. So how did, all this, how did all this help us? Well, by prefetching the HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, we saw a 30% reduction in our time to interactive metric. So we sped, that, we sped the user up when they clicked that sign up button, 30%. Pretty amazing, especially considering it was 
had almost no engineering trade-offs. It was pretty easy to implement, and we just got all this for free, basically. So how do we know that all these prefetching mechanisms are actually working? Well, we can use the performance API to help us. So for, for this, for this uh, project, we used two methods. One, we obviously just looked for improvements in our time to interactive metrics, so were we making things faster? And then two, we used the performance API again to um, directly detect if our resources were being served from cache. So this is what a cache hit looks like in Chrome's dev tools. You can see under the size column, in parentheses, it says from memory cache. And this means that it's a cache hit. If it wasn't a cache hit, you'd see something like 21 kilobytes or something in this column. So if you all are having problems um, getting caching to work, I want you to check two things. One, make sure that the disable cache checkbox <laughs> isn't checked. I ran into this problem one or 20 times when debugging. Because, <laughs> you know, you just leave it on and you forget about it. And why isn't my stuff being cached? Um, but then two, oh, yeah, um, my clicker's broken. There we go. Um, but then two, I want you to check the response headers coming back um, from your resources, and you're looking for the cache control header. Now, caching is a fascinating but super broad topic, well beyond the scope of this talk. But for our purposes now, just make sure that your server serving the resources is configured to allow for caching. So, we can use, as I said, as I introduced earlier, we can use the performance API to get a, a list of resources and their timings. Um, and we can use this to detect if our resources are, are cache hits or not. So as I said, this returns an array of objects, which looks something like this. And here we have the name, which is the URL of the resource. We have the duration, and that's in milliseconds, which is how long it took the browser to load the resource. And then we have the transfer size. And this is in bytes. And this is the size of the resource going over the wire. The size of the resource going over the wire is the operative phrase here, because if you have a transfer size of zero, no bytes were sent over the wire. So where did the resource come from? Well, it came from the cache. So in this way, you can, you can map through all of, your, all of your resources looking for transfer sizes of zero, and then they were served from cache. You report this back, and then you can know how well you're doing as far as prefetching is, is concerned. Now, I did have a section in here about browser compatibility, but iOS 11 dropped, and then Safari now includes support for this. So good job, Safari. All right, so in conclusion, the internet isn't always great, from shovel-severed fiber cables to mobile devices on 3G. Um, you can use plain JavaScript. It's, don't be scared of it. It's actually pretty fun. And sending less down to the client is definitely a good thing. But for places where you can't defer React or you, you, you can't go to plain JavaScript, I want you to try to prefetch resources where you can. So you can use the built-in browser API and consider using the XHR request technique as well. And then you can use the performance API to instrument and measure timed interactive. And you can see if your resources are cache hits. Well, thank you very much, folks. Um, please follow my Twitter and uh, the Netflix UI Engineering Twitter. And thanks a lot.